Peter Curtin was a German serial killer known as both the Vampire of Dusseldorf and the Dusseldorf Monster, who committed a series of murders and sexual assaults between February and November 1929 in the city of Dusseldorf. In the years prior to these assaults and murders, Curtin had amassed a lengthy criminal record for offenses including arson and attempted murder. He also confessed to the 1913 murders of a 9-year-old girl in Mulheim im Rhein, and a 17-year-old girl in Los Czechs. Described by Dr. Karl Berg as the king of the sexual perverts, Curtin was found guilty of nine counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder for which he was tried and sentenced to death by beheading in April 1931. He was subsequently executed in July 1931. Curtin became known as the, the Vampire of Dusseldorf as he occasionally made attempts to drink the blood from his victims' his wounds and the Dusseldorf monster both because the majority of his murders were committed in and around the city of Dusseldorf, and the savage area he inflicted upon his victims' bodies. Early Life Childhood Peter Curtin was born into a poverty-stricken, abusive family in Mulheim im Rhein on 26 May 1883, the third of 13 children two of whom died at an early age. Curtin's parents were both alcoholics who lived in a one-bedroom apartment. In 1888, Curtin attempted to drown one of his playmates. Four years later, he befriended a local dog catcher who lived in the same building as his family, and began accompanying him on his rounds. This individual would often torture and kill the animals he caught and Curtin soon became an active and willing participant in torturing the animals himself. Being the eldest surviving son, Curtin was the target of much of his father's physical abuse, and although he was a good scholar, he would later recollect his academic performance suffered due to the extensive physical violence he endured from his father, which frequently caused him to refuse to return home from school. Adolescence At the age of 13, Curtin formed a relationship with a girl his age who, although happy to allow Curtin to undress and fondle her, would resist any attempts he made to engage in intercourse. In 1897, Curtin left school. At his father's insistence, he obtained employment as an apprentice molder. First Attempted Murder Curtin claimed to have committed his first murder in November 1899. No contemporary records exist to corroborate Curtin's claims. If this attack did indeed take place, the victim likely survived this assault. First Convictions Shortly thereafter, in 1900, Curtin was arrested for fraud. He would be rearrested later the same year on the same charge. Although on this second occasion, charges pertaining to his 1899 Dusseldorf thefts, plus the attempted murder of a girl with a firearm were added to the indictment. Released in the summer of 1904, Curtin was drafted into the German army. He was deployed to the Alsatian city of Metz to serve in the 98th Infantry Regiment. Although he soon deserted, that autumn, Curtin began committing acts of arson which he would discreetly watch from a distance as emergency services attempted to extinguish the fires. The majority of these fires were in barns and hay lofts, and Curtin would estimate to police he had committed approximately 24 acts of arson upon his arrest that New Year's Eve. He also freely admitted these fires had been committed both for his sexual excitement and in the hopes of burning sleeping tramps alive. As a result of his desertion, Curtin was tried by the military system and convicted of desertion in addition to multiple counts of arson, robbery and attempted robbery, the latter charges pertaining to acts he had also committed that year, and imprisoned from 1905 to 1913. Curtin served his sentence in Munster, with much of his time spent in solitary confinement for repeated instances of insubordination. It was on the 25th of May 1913, 
I had been stealing, specializing in public bars or inns where the owners lived on the floor above. In a room above an inn at Köln Mulheim, I discovered a child of about ten asleep. Her head was facing the window. I seized it with my left hand and strangled her for about a minute and a half. The child woke up and struggled but lost consciousness. I had a small but sharp pocket knife with me and I held the child's head and cut her throat. I heard the blood spurt and drip on the mat beside the bed. It spurted in an arch, right over my hand. The whole thing lasted about three minutes. Then I locked the door again and went back home to Dusseldorf. Quote. Murders. First Murders. The first murder Curtin is known to have committed occurred on the 25th of May 1913, during the course of a burglary at a tavern in the town of Mulheim im Rhine. He encountered a nine-year-old girl named Christine Klein asleep in her bed. He strangled the child, then slashed her twice across the throat with a pocket knife, ejaculating as he heard the blood dripping from her wounds onto the floor by her bed. The following day, Curtin specifically returned to Köln to drink in a tavern located directly opposite that inn, which he had murdered Christine Klein, in order that he could listen to the locals' reactions to the child's murder. He would later recollect to investigators he derived an extreme sense of gratification from the general disgust and outrage he had heard in the patrons' conversations. Two months later, again in the course of committing a burglary with the aid of a skeleton key, Curtin broke into a home in Law's checks, discovering a 17-year-old girl named Gertrude Franken. Curtin manually strangled the girl, ejaculating at the sight of blood spouting from the Franken's mouth. Curtin managed to escape from the scene of both this murder and that of Klein undetected. Imprisonment and Release Just days after the murder of Gertrude Franken, on the 14th of July, Curtin was arrested for a series of arson attacks and burglaries. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment. Released in April 1921, Curtin relocated to Altenburg, where he initially lived with his sister. Through his sister, Curtin became acquainted with a woman three years his senior named August Scharf, a sweet shop proprietor and former prostitute who had previously been convicted of shooting her fiancé to death. 1929 On the 3rd of February 1929, Curtin stalked an elderly woman named Apollonia Kuhn, waiting until Kuhn was shielded from the view of potential witnesses by bushes. Curtin pounced upon her, grabbing her by the lapels of her coat and shouting the words, No row, don't scream, quote, Despite the differences in age and sex of these three victims, the fact that all three crimes had been committed in the Flingern district of Dusseldorf at dusk, that each victim had received a multitude of stab wounds likely inflicted in rapid succession and invariably involving at least one wound to the temple, plus the absence of a common motive such as robbery led investigators to conclude the same. Perpetrator had committed all three attacks. Furthermore, the seemingly random selection of these victims led criminologists to remark as to the abnormal nature of the perpetrator. Although Curtin did attempt to strangle four women between March and July 1929, one of whom he claimed to have thrown into the Rhine River, three months after Curtin had murdered Maria Hahn, he posted an anonymous letter to the police in which he confessed to Hahn's murder adding that her remains had been buried in a field. In this letter, Curtin also drew a crude map describing the location of her remains. This letter would prove sufficiently detailed to enable investigators to locate Han's remains on the 15th of November. Following the murder of Maria Han, Curtin changed his choice of weapon from scissors to an knife in an apparent effort to convince Police more than one perpetrator was responsible for the spate of assaults and murders. Curtin attempted to murder two further victims, one by strangulation, another by stabbing, in September, before opting to predominantly use a hammer in his murders. Hammer Attacks 
On the evening of 30 September, Curtin encountered a 31-year-old servant girl named Ida Reuter at Dusseldorf Station. He successfully persuaded Reuter to accompany him to a café, then for a walk through the local Hof Garden close to the Rhine River. On 7 November 1929, Curtin encountered a five-year-old girl named Gertrude Alberman in the Flingern district of Dusseldorf. He persuaded the child to accompany him to a section of deserted allotments, where he seized her by the throat and strangled her, stabbing her once in the left temple with a pair of scissors as he did so. Investigation By the late summer of 1929, the murders committed by the individual the press had dubbed the Vampire of Dusseldorf were receiving considerable national and international attention. Two days after the murder of Gertrude Alberman, a local communist newspaper received a map revealing the location of the grave of Maria Hahn, who confirmed the same individual had written each letter, thus leading the chief inspector of Dusseldorf police, Ernst Janau, to conclude that one man was responsible for most or all of the spate of assaults and murders. 1930 The murder of Gertrude Alberman would prove to be Curtin's final fatal attack. Although he did engage in a spate of non-fatal hammer attacks and attempted strangulations between February and May 1930, although all recipients survived and many were able to describe their attacker to police, on 14 May 1930, an unknown man approached a 20-year-old woman named Maria Budlick at Dusseldorf Station. The identity of the man who ostensibly came to Budlick's aid was Peter Curtin. Curtin invited the distressed young woman to his apartment on Metmaner Strasse to eat and drink, before Budlick, correctly deducing the underlying motive for Curtin's hospitality stated she was uninterested in engaging in sex with him. Budlick did not report this assault to police but described her ordeal in a letter to a friend, although she addressed the letter incorrectly. As such, the letter was opened at the post office by a clerk on the 19th of May. Upon reading the contents of the letter, this clerk forwarded the letter to the Dusseldorf police. This letter was read by Chief Inspector Jana who deduced there was a slim chance Budlick's assailant may be the Dusseldorf murderer. Chief Inspector Jana interviewed Budlick, who recounted her ordeal, further divulging one of the reasons Curtin had spared her was because she had falsely informed him she could not remember his address. She agreed to lead the police to Curtin's home, and led police to Curtin's Metmaner Strasse address. When the landlady of the property let Budlick into the room of 71 Metmaner Strasse, Budlick confirmed to Chief Inspector Jana this was the address of her assailant. The landlady confirmed to the Chief Inspector the tenant's name was Peter Curtin. Arrest and Confession Although Curtin was not at home when Budlick and Chief Inspector Jana searched his property, he spotted the pair in the communal hallway and promptly left the property. Knowing that his identity was now known to the police and suspecting they may also have connected him to the crimes committed by the, the vampire of Dusseldorf, Curtin confessed to his wife he had raped Budlick and that, because of his previous convictions, he may receive 15 years penal labor. With his wife's consent, he found lodgings in the Adlerstrasse district of Dusseldorf and did not return to his own home until the 23rd of May. Upon returning home, Curtin confessed to his wife he was the, the vampire of Dusseldorf. With Curtin's full consent, he urging his wife to collect the substantial reward offered for his capture. Curtin freely admitted his guilt in all the crimes police had attributed to the, the vampire of Dusseldorf and further confessed he had committed the unsolved murders of Christine Klein and Gertrude Franken. In 1913, in total, Curtin admitted to 68 crimes including 10 murders, and 31 attempted murders. Psychological Study As Curtin awaited his trial, then later as he awaited his execution, he was extensively interviewed by Dr. Carl Berg. 
in reference to the actual choice of weapon used in his attacks. Curtin stressed that although he had changed his actual method of attack to deceive investigators into believing they were seeking more than one perpetrator, the weapon he used was inconsequential in reference to his ultimate objective of seeing his victim's blood. Elaborating, Curtin stated, whether I took an E for a pair of scissors or a hammer in order to see blood was a matter of indifference to me or mere chance. Often after the hammer blows the bleeding victims moved and struggled, just as they did when they were throttled. Quote. However, Curtin would contradict these claims by proclaiming to both Drive, Berg and legal examiners that his primary motive in all his criminal activities was to both strike back at to Dr. Berg and the legal examiners. Curtin did not deny that he had sexually molested his female victims, or to have stroked or digitally penetrated their genitals as he stabbed, slashed, strangled or bludgeoned their bodies. Although throughout his trial Curtin consistently claimed the sexual assault of his victims was not his primary motive, both Berg and other psychologists concluded Curtin was not insane, was fully able to control his actions, and appreciated the criminality of his conduct. Each ruled Curtin was legally sane and competent to stand trial. Trial On 13 April, 1931, Peter Curtin stood trial in Dusseldorf. He was charged with nine counts of murder and seven of attempted murder and was tried before presiding Judge Drive. Rose, Curtin pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Proceedings began with the prosecution formally reciting each of the charges against Curtin, before they recited the formal confession he had provided to police following his arrest. I have none. Never have I felt any misgiving in my soul. Never did I think to myself that what I did was bad. Even though human society condemns it, my blood and the blood of my victims must be on the heads of my torturers. The punishments I have suffered have destroyed all my feelings as a human being. That was why I had no pity for my victims. Quote. Peter Curtin, responding to the presiding judge's question as to whether he possessed a conscience at his trial, 1931, Having first claimed that his initial confession had been delivered to simply allow his wife to recoup the reward money offered for the Dusseldorf vampire's capture to counteract Curtin's insanity defense, the prosecution introduced five of the most eminent doctors and psychiatrists in Germany to testify at the trial. Each testified that Curtin was legally sane and had been perfectly in control of his actions and impulses at all times. Typical of the testimony delivered by these experts was that of Professor Franz Scioli, who testified as to Curtin's actual motivation in his crimes being the desire to achieve the sexual gratification he demanded, and that this satisfaction could only be achieved by acts of brutality, violence and Curtin's knowledge of the pain and misery his actions would cause to others. Further proof of Curtin's awareness was referenced by the premeditated nature of his crimes, his ability to abandon an attack if he sensed a risk of being disturbed, and his acute memory of both his crimes and their chronological detail. Also disclosed in the first week of the trial were the deaths of the two boys whom Curtin had confessed to drowning at the age of nine with the prosecution suggesting these deaths indicated Curtin had displayed a homicidal propensity dating much earlier than 1913. However, this view was disputed by medical witnesses, who suggested that although indicative of an inherent depravity, these two deaths should not be compared to Curtin's later murders as to a child. The death of a friend can be seen as nothing more than an inconsequential passing. Upon cross-examination, Curtin's defense attorney, Dr. Alex Wenner, in a further attempt to discredit the validity of many of the charges recited at the opening stages of the trial, Wenner also questioned whether the occasional physical inaccuracies of the crimes described in his client's confession equated to Curtin having fabricated at least some of the crimes. Thus supporting his contention, Curtin possessed a diseased mind, 
In response, one of these experts, Dr. Carl Berg, conceded that sections of Curtin's confession were false, but argued that the knowledge he possessed of the murder scenes and the wounds inflicted upon the victims left him in no doubt as to his guilt, and that the minor embellishments in his confessions could be attributed to Curtin's narcissistic personality. Conviction The trial lasted 10 days. On the 22nd of April, the jury retired to consider their verdict. They would deliberate for less than two hours before reaching their verdict. Curtin was found guilty and sentenced to death on nine counts of murder. He was also found guilty of seven counts of attempted murder. Curtin displayed no emotion as the sentence was passed, although in his final address to the court, he did state that he now saw his crimes as being so ghastly that not want to make any sort of excuse for them. Curtin did not lodge an appeal his conviction, although he did submit a petition for pardon to the Minister of Justice, who was known to be an opponent of capital punishment. Execution On the evening of 1 July 1931, Curtin received his last meal. He ordered Wiener Schnitzel, a bottle of white wine, and fried potatoes. Curtin devoured the entire meal before requesting a second helping. Prison staff decided to grant his request. At 6 o'clock on the morning of 2 July, shortly before his head was placed on the guillotine, Curtin turned to the psychiatrist and asked the question, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. Quote. Aftermath Following Curtin's 1931 execution, his head was dissected and mummified. The brain was removed and subjected to forensic analysis in an attempt to explain his personality and behavior. The examinations of Curtin's brain revealed no abnormalities. The autopsy conducted upon Curtin's body revealed that Aside from his having an enlarged thymus gland, Curtin had not been suffering any physical abnormality. The interviews Curtin granted to Dr. Carl Berg in 1930 and 1931 would prove to be the first psychological study conducted upon a sexual serial killer. These interviews would also form the basis of Berg's book, The Sadist. Shortly after the Second World War, Curtin's head was transported to the United States. It is currently on display at the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. Media Film The first film to draw inspiration from the murders committed by Peter Curtin, M., was released in May 1931, directed by Fritz Lang. M starred Peter Lorre as a fictional child killer named Hans Becker. In addition to drawing inspiration from the case of Peter Curtin, M was also inspired by the then-recent and notorious crimes of Fritz Harman and Carl Grossman. The 1965 thriller Le Vampire de Dusseldorf, The Vampire of Dusseldorf, is directly based on the case of Peter Curtin, directed by Robert Hossein who also cast himself as Peter Curtin. The film also stars Marie France Piger. The 2009 film Normal is based on the crimes of Peter Curtin. Directed by Julia Sevcik, Normal is a film adaptation of playwright Anthony Nielsen's Normal, The Dusseldorf Ripper. The film stars Milan Nako as Curtin, and is portrayed from the point of view of his defense lawyer. Books Elder, says murder scenes, normality, deviance, and criminal violence in Weimar Berlin ISBN 978-0-472-11724-6. Wilson, Colin, Wilson, Dame in the World's Most Evil Murderers. Real Life Stories of Infamous Killers ISBN 978-1-405-48828-0. Wilson, Colin. Wilson, Damon, Wilson, 
row in the giant book of world famous murders ISBN 9780752501222 Theater Normal The Dusseldorf Ripper is a play focusing on the case of Peter Curtin scripted by Anthony Nielsen the play was first performed at Edinburgh's Pleasance Theatre in August 1991. Normal, the Dusseldorf Ripper has since become inspiration for one film. Television The BBC have commissioned a documentary upon the murders committed by Peter Curtin. This documentary, Profiles of the Criminal Mind, largely focuses on the forensic profiling of Curtin's crimes and was first broadcast in 2001.